Hey everyone and welcome back to the Complete Dentures 1 lecture series for the Department of Restorative Dentistry in New York City College of Technology. Once again, I am Professor Oscar Galvis. This is lecture 9 in the set. We're going to discuss the posterior setup. This was a lecture that would normally have been combined with the lower anterior setup portion. However, given the length of the lecture, I felt that it was best to divide the content into two separate lectures. There will be a continuation of this lecture in the next module set. Let's begin. Previously, we talked about setting our basic arrangement for our maxillary six anterior teeth. Now we're going to get into setting our posterior teeth. Here are some guidelines. When setting posterior teeth, be sure that the occlusal plane does not exceed the height of the retromolar pad. If the last molar is higher than the retromolar pad, the entire setup must be lowered. There will be some cases where occlusal plane may be higher, but usually when creating two complete dentures. Now this is an overall general rule, but it's very arbitrary. Uh, something like this is something that we should follow as a guideline. However, guidelines can change dependent upon the situation. When we look further into the subject of the height of the occlusal plane and where teeth should go posteriorly, uh, we see that if the height of occlusal plane within natural dentition without malocclusion does not exceed the height of the retromolar pads, then why should an occlusal plane in a denture setup exceed the height of the retromolar pads? In most cases, it shouldn't. This statement is true to a degree where in many cases where occlusal plane can be difficult to find or we're not sure if our clinicians have captured it properly, we can always use that as a guideline. If we think about how our occlusal rims were made, if we go back to that occlusion rim lecture, we see that our mandibular rim in the posterior, the height was determined by two thirds the height of the retromolar pad. Now that must be for a reason. And that is because on average, it is highly likely that the occlusal plane wouldn't exceed the height of that retromolar pad. Now, once again, every patient is different. There are situations where this may occur, but it is the safest bet when in doubt to follow the path of the retromolar pad in terms of the occlusal plane. Another anatomical landmark that we can use to dictate where these denture teeth should be should be the tuberosity. Although the tuberosities are the most distal features of the maxillary edentulous ridge and are technically a part of it, denture teeth are not set on the tuberosities. If maxillary posterior denture teeth extend onto the tuberosities, a smaller size should be selected of tooth or drop a posterior tooth from the setup. First premolars are the teeth usually admitted. The reason why the first premolars would be admitted to fit the second molar is because there is more chewing surface on the molar than there is on a premolar. Second premolars tend to be slightly larger in reference to the occlusal table than the first premolar. That is why the decision is usually to remove the first premolar because the remaining posterior teeth have larger occlusal tables for function and stability during function. So using the mandibular residual ridge as a landmark for setting teeth is a very big deal. Center of the ridge should be key in your mind when setting teeth. It is paramount to the case. And if they are not set across the crest of the ridge or the center of the residual ridge, it could be detrimental to the case. So the buccal lingual positioning of posterior denture teeth in the maxillary arch is largely dictated by the most favorable position of posterior denture teeth in the mandibular arch. So once again, that statement is basically saying in layman's terms that the mandibular posterior teeth are going to guide the position of the maxillary posterior teeth, right? It's largely dictated by the most favorable position of the posterior denture teeth in the mandibular arch. That's what that means, okay? So as we read further, when following this rule, the maxillary posterior denture teeth will be more or less centered over the crest of the maxillary ridges. Because the mandibular ridges absorb downward and outward, maxillary posterior denture teeth are rarely placed too far lingually when a technician sets them. The tendency is actually to place them too far buccally. Basically, all this is saying is that in regards to tooth position on ridges, because the resorption patterns are opposite, where the maxillary resorbs in and up and the mandibular resorbs downward and outward, we end up with a compensation here, right? If we place our posterior mandibular teeth over the crest of the ridge, 
then our maxillary will most likely be slightly buckle off of the ridge. And that's okay. And this is the reason why. When we talk about setting posterior teeth uh, or setting dentures functionally, we talk about issues with mandibulars. In the beginning of the semester, we had that conversation about how mandibular dentures tend to be the dentures that end up in the, in the nightstand, right? They're uncomfortable. Patients don't like to wear them. However, somehow they adapt pretty well to a maxillary denture. Here's why. When we talk about a maxillary denture, what actually holds the retention on a maxillary denture? The answer is the palate plays a large role. One is the fact that the palate is there to support lateral forces especially if they're not directly over the crest of the ridge, the denture is kind of balanced and the palate helps that. The other reason is that it's easy to create a seal, right? You actually get uh, aid and retention with the amount of saliva that a patient has in their mouth. The saliva actually forms a beaded seal around the denture and within that denture there's atmospheric pressure. That's why when a well-fitting denture comes out, you can have a a sound that almost sounds like a, the breaking of a seal, like a pop, an air sound. That sound is actually the seal breaking, right? The atmospheric pressure being held within that denture is being released. And maxillary dentures are usually the dentures that have that kind of retention. Now, when we talk about the lower, we talk about the lower having the ability to move, right? The lower jaw is the arch that moves. It is the most unstable arch. So that is why it's the most important arch in reference to uh, rehabilitating someone in denture work. We're talking about making a mandibular denture that is mobile, right? It's a removable prosthetic that is moving on the ridge. It doesn't have the kind of seal that a maxillary denture has. Therefore, it's important that the stresses are going to be distributed along the crest of the ridge into the bone. If they're not, Imagine setting the tooth off of the ridge when forces are applied directly over the tooth and there's no bone structure to support the tooth underneath, then the denture ends up rocking left and right. And what happens? Rocking left and right causes one source. Patients are not happy about their lower denture. They feel like they're in pain and that's why it ends up in the nightstand. But another adverse reaction to the rocking of the denture or ill-fitting denture is that that rubbing can actually wear away bone faster, right? We're talking about bone resorption that happens over time. Well, ill-fitting denture uh, expedites that process, okay? So all those things lead to the reason why the mandibular denture is the most important and why those posterior teeth really need to be over the crest of the ridge as you see in this image. And when we talk about cusps, that are functional, we'll get into that a little later in this lecture, we see that when we talk about crest of the residual ridge, we're talking about the buccal cusp of the mandibular posterior teeth need to be over the crest, not the fossa, because the buccal cusp is the functional cusp and it is going to create the forces as it enters the fossa of the maxillary cusp. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The Air Force has many different ways and a plethora of ways of setting teeth, different occlusal schemes that you'll be reading about in your required reading this week. Initially, we have here the maxillary arch arrangement of the Pilkington-Turner posterior teeth setup. So what we see here is basically, um, we talk about compensating curve, which we'll get to more in depth in a second, but basically there is two curves in the mouth, a lateral curve and an anterior posterior curve. And we can see that anterior posterior curve here in the diagram to the top left you'll see that the buccal cusps are about a half millimeter on the premolars off of the plane. And that plane, uh, just for your reference, is the same plane that the canine and the central is touching. So it's off the plane about a half millimeter and the lingual cusps of the premolars are touching that plane. When we go to the molar, we see that the mesial lingual cusp is touching the plane while the distal cusps of that molar are off the plane. Right? And you kind of see this curve accentuating here. It's very accentuated towards the second molar, where the second molar is no longer on the plane. It's about three-fourths of a millimeter off on the mesial lingual cusps and a full millimeter off on the uh, lingual distal cusp. And you'll take a look at what that looks like in cross-section view. On the image on the lower, we can see that little triangle on that platform will represent the crest of the mandibular ridge and how that should look in reference to the tooth position on the maxillary. Now another type of setup that we talk about or is included in the Air Force Manual is your maxillary arch uh, arrangement of cuspid teeth. Uh, except the Pilkington Turner posterior. So this is another way to set. Um, the terminology can be a little confusing in the Air Force, but basically this method of setting is, is as you see, 
uh, just a variation of what you just saw. Uh, main difference being that those buckle cusps on the premolars are actually on the plane, so they are touching at the same time and they coincide with contact on the lingual as well. So all those cusp tips are touching at one point, but the molars are still set kind of in the same respect where the first molar has a lingual cusp touching and the second molar is off the plane. So going back to something that was mentioned earlier, we spoke about a compensating curve. All right. A compensating curve is an alignment of occluding surfaces and incisal edges along definite anterior, posterior, and lateral curvatures for purposes of developing complete balance in dentures. All right. So this compensating curve is created so that we can have a complete bilateral balanced occlusion, which is the type of occlusion that we're going to be aiming for during the semester in our laboratory courses. So if we break down this compensating curve, the lateral component of the compensating curve is called the curve of Wilson. We see that in the image to the bottom right. That is the lateral curve, almost like the smile line that you create when a person smiles. Then we have our anterior posterior curve, which is the curve of Spee. And that's the curve that tapers up towards your tuberosity. And you see that in the previous slide as you set your posterior teeth. Uh, according to the scheme that was showed to you, those molars end up off the plane slightly. So there's no need to over exaggerate the curve. And if we look at this image here, you see what I'm talking about. You don't need to exaggerate the, the different curves. By setting the teeth accordingly with the proper cusp touching the plates, you'll see that the curve actually creates itself. So by accentuating the curve, you're actually creating too much of a compensating curve, and it might hinder the ability for you to obtain a bilaterally balanced occlusion. Okay. So we look here in this image. Uh, if you were asked, you know, what type of occlusion do you see here? And we see that this follows uh, a basic arrangement in which in the second diagram where the buccal cusps were touching with the lingual cusps. So those are the differences. Um, it's kind of funny to see when you look at pictures from your Air Force manual and look at the way that the teeth are set. Uh, I can immediately see then in image E, uh, the canine on the patient's left, that would be number 11, is actually set higher than the tooth, uh, the canine number six. Um, there's always variations in setups, but it's uh, interesting to use your knowledge to kind of evaluate any images of setups you see and really tweak your eye so that you can assess your own setup and know what it's supposed to look like and what it shouldn't look like. So as we begin in this scenario, uh, we will have already set our maxillary uh, denture or at least our maxillary quadrant either right or left so uh, when we're positioning our teeth and I, I do promote this type of setup when it comes to setting teeth because setting the first molar is important that is the largest tooth with the largest occlusal table therefore if this is going to promote the most amount of function and stability for my dentures then I would prefer that tooth to be exactly where I want it to be Okay, so when setting the teeth in centric occlusion, uh, you can attach a cone of soft wax to the left mandibular first molar. You can also do it on the right side. It doesn't really matter which side you prefer to go to first. You're going to place the tooth on the mandibular record base in the approximate position. It will assume in centric occlusion. You're going to close the articulator. From the buccal view, while the wax is still soft, you can position this tooth. And uh, the basis of centric occlusion and uh, class one occlusion, we spoke about angles classification, we see once again in a class one occlusion, according to the angles classification system, our mesial buccal cusp tip of our maxillary first molar is lining up with the mesial buccal groove of the mandibular first molar. Okay. So when you flip the tooth around, you can also see that from the lingual view, the mesial lingual cusp of the upper first molar is seated into the central fossa of the lower. And the mesial lingual cusp of the lower first molar fills the lingual embrasure between the upper uh, second premolar and the first molar. So you kind of see that this molar and the way it sits is almost as if it's like a puzzle piece. It's almost like matrices seating into one another, right? And this is the way occlusion really is. Proper cusp to fossa relationship. That's a term that we're going to talk about as well in this lecture. 
uh, when you have those proper Custafasa relationships, you're guaranteed a good occlusal scheme. Most denture teeth are fabricated to fit into a class one occlusion. So you shouldn't have triangular embrasures and black spaces in your setup. You should be able to kind of have a tight occlusion uh, when we're talking at least about a balanced, bilateral balanced occlusion. The Air Force goes on to talk about positioning the mandibular second molar. Once that first molar has been seated, it kind of dictates the rest of the setup. And once that molar is seated properly in your class one occlusion, you can also see that the teeth are manufactured to fit one another properly in that class one occlusion. So that is why the Air Force talks about the best type of way of setting teeth is actually leaving your anteriors last. These teeth are mathematically fabricated that they fit into a class one relationship. So if you set your teeth properly, your lower anterior should fit in the space that's remaining after you complete your entire setup. And you see then it goes to your second premolar working your way towards the anterior. Uh, what you'll see is that it doesn't really matter which direction you go in, honestly. If you set your first molar, you can either work your way anterior or work your way posterior. Either way, once you get that first molar in the proper position, the rest of the teeth fall into place. So we spoke about functional cusp tips uh, earlier in the lecture when we were talking about crest of the ridge, right? I said that the buccal cusp tip has to land on the crest of the ridge because that is a functional cusp. Let's talk a little bit about those terms, right? Uh, also known as stamp and shearing cusps. So stamp cusps, uh, they are considered to be the lingual of the upper and the buccal of the lower, right? These are uh, another name for stamp cusp is occlusal vertical dimension holding cusps. This is because stamp cusps act to maintain a constant distance between upper and lower jaws when teeth are in MI, MI standing for maximum intercuspation. So these cusp tips are holding the space, right? Those cusp tips are the ones that are sitting into fosses, and those are holding the vertical dimension of, of the patient. And then we have shearing cusps, which are the buckle of the upper and the lingual of the lower. By exclusion, shearing cusps are cusps other than stamp cusps. That is, shearing cusps do not maintain the vertical distance between upper and lower jaws when the teeth are in maximum intercuspation. So thinking about what a shearing cusp is, it's really used technically to shear things, right? To cut things. When you think about how you chew on a bagel or a loaf of bread, you grab it from your posterior and you tear upwards, right? That's because your buckle of the upper uh, posterior teeth act as shearing cusps. They, they shear food, right? So cusp relationships with opposing teeth, when teeth come into maximum intercuspation in any of the classifications, one, two, or three, the stamp cusps are in one arch uh, and they hit into the fossa or across occlusal embrasures of the teeth in the opposite arch. Two basic varieties of stamp cusp arrangements are used in making prosthodontic restorations. And these two types of occlusal patterns are very, very important to understand, and we're gonna cover them a little bit more in depth now. We have our cusp to occlusal embrasure pattern, and we also have a cusp to fossa pattern. We just top, talked about a proper cusp to fossa relationship, but the truth is, is that you can also have a cusp to embrasure relationship. And we're gonna talk about those two and the advantages or disadvantages of each. So here we have a little diagram that talks about our cusp to embrasure pattern of occlusion. So if we see our maxillary lingual cusps are in the first column of this chart, and then the second column of the chart is the contact area on the mandibular teeth. So here you have a diagram with the blue dots being uh, on the maxillary lingual surfaces, and they're being received into the mandibular posterior teeth into those respective areas. So we talk about our first premolar, right? Our lingual cusp, where does it fall? Well, since it's a, a cusp to embrasure pattern of occlusion, it's not gonna fall into a fossa, it's gonna fall into an embrasure. And what's the embrasure? The embrasure is the space in between two teeth, right? That interproximal space there. So when we talk about cusp to embrasure pattern of occlusion, we look at our first premolar, it's going to fall in the distal fossa uh, of the lower first premolar, right? And then we have uh, distal fossa of the lower second premolar, and we go on and on. And we look at number four, the distal lingual cusp of the first molar can fall into the embrasure between the first and second molars as well. So you'll see that there's a circle on the diagram versus the blue dot. Uh, they do vary, but cusp to embrasure is usually talking about the cusp tip falling in between teeth, in between embrasures, not into fossas, okay? When we look at the 
opposite, now we're looking at the, the red dots. We're talking about our stamp cusps, our functional cusps on our mandibular, which are our buckles, and where they're received into. So here we have our receiving areas, and as you see, our buccal cusps on our mandibular are falling in between embrasures more than fossas here, right? Our first premolar is falling into the embrasure between the canine and first premolar. Our second premolar, once again, falling into an embrasure between the first and second premolars, and so on and so forth. These charts are important, and I would like you to uh, review these as much as possible so that if uh, in the assessments or any of your exams comes up where I ask you about cusp to embrasure pattern of occlusion, where does the first premolar fall on the mandibular uh, buccal cusps? Where, where does that receiving area fall? You should know that it's between the canine and first premolar, okay? And then we talk about, once again, our other pattern of occlusion, which in my opinion is something that's, uh, it's, it's a better way of occlusion uh, from my perspective. Uh, a cusp with the fossa, and uh, here once again are your contact points that you can review um, and memorize so that you know where these teeth should fall, and therefore the setting of your teeth in laboratory class is that much easier. When we talk about our advantages with a cusp, uh, cusp, cusp to fossa relationship, a cusp to fossa relationship has three significant advantages over a cusp to embrasure relationship. And the first is that it better directs forces over the long axis of the teeth, right? When you're hitting in between teeth, in between embrasures, you're actually causing force that can cause teeth to shift, right? Because teeth are connected by a periodontal ligament in the mouth and your teeth have give to them, right? So you don't want to extend forces on areas in between teeth. It's always safer to distribute forces down the center of a tooth uh, rather than, uh, or an occlusal table, rather than in between teeth, right? That's when you're more likely to fracture something. And some other advantages here, second, is that it helps stabilize individual teeth in their respective positions in the dental arches, right? We just spoke about how forces in between teeth can actually move teeth, and once again, positioning forces over tooth surfaces rather than in between teeth will stabilize the individual teeth in their respective positions. And finally, a cusp to fossa relationship reduces foot, food impaction in the proximal areas since because there are no cusp tips striking in the embrasures uh, to force the teeth apart during that mastication process. Uh, once again, this is an occlusion or an issue that would really happen with natural dentition. However, um, the same kind of occurs for denture work. Uh, if you do have any spaces in between your teeth when you're setting that aren't filled with acrylic, uh, custom fossa can cause that issue. But once again, uh, forces in between two surfaces that are not fused together or one piece will always cause extra stress, which could cause uh, breakage or fracturing, whether it be a natural tooth or a denture tooth. That's going to complete our portion about posterior occlusion for this week. I don't want to overload you with too much information. Uh, we will be continuing the conversation of different occlusal schemes in the posterior, such as cross bites, monoplane occlusion, lingualized occlusion next week, as well as our lower anterior setup, which is uh, a brief overview. Uh, for this week and next week, uh, it is some content-heavy literature, so I want you to spend the time to focus on these pages and read over 258 to 278, which covers those different denture occlusal schemes, as well as your lower anterior setup. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the lecture this week, and uh, good luck with your other courses. And towards the end of the semester, good luck on finishing up your laboratory projects. And if you need anything, reach out. I'll talk to you guys next week.